Hi, everyone. This is Don Smith. And today I'd like to welcome a special guest, um, actually a really good friend of mine and a colleague. Uh, we've worked a number of years together, Mr. Gary Hart. And uh, Gary, yeah. how are you doing? Good. How are you, Don? <laughs> I'm doing good. Gary's at uh, his home up in the Sacramento area. And it looks like I'm sitting out over the ocean. You guys like my new uh, setup, but... Uh, this was actually a picture from the other day, just an iPhone photo, and I'm having fun with the software here. So I'm really excited to have Gary on. Uh, I've been wanting to uh, have a guest on the show like once a month, and over Christmas I got good and lazy and uh, took about four weeks off, but we're up and running again. And today uh, Gary's going to talk about your camera's vision, and I know uh, in the world of digital and what we can do with multiple exposures and HDRs and stacking frames and all that good stuff. I, I know because I've worked with Gary for so long, he takes the approach as a, a film shooter, like he's still shooting film, which I think is very cool. But before we get started, Gary, if you could just tell the audience a little bit about your background. Sure. Um, I've been doing photography professionally for about 20 years now. Um, uh, before that, I was a serious amateur. I, I had a career in what you'd call technical communications before that. So I was a tech writer and tech support and uh, training, that kind of thing. And then uh, started doing art shows while I kept my day job. And then almost, gosh, it's been close to 20 years ago, not quite, but almost, I um, left that and started doing photo workshops, which is what I do now. Uh, for a while, I was doing both photo workshops and art shows, uh, which I really enjoyed. But it, that was like running two different businesses. So um, the the workshops seemed to be doing better uh, for me. And so I just I just stuck with that. Um, and, uh, you know, you and I, Don, we met Gosh, it's been it's been almost 20 years ago. We met in a blizzard in, in Yosemite. Perhaps you remember. <laughs> I, I do. I was driving today and I started thinking how many years ago was that? Yeah. I came up with at least 17 years ago, but I think it was, it was 2005. Wow. I think it was, I think it was 2005. 19 years. Five then. or six. Anyway, it's been we're, a long we're time. We're closing in on 20. <laughs> it's, it's, it's been a long time. And um, at that time, um, yeah, it could have been 2006 because I think I was just thinking about getting started with workshops and I did my first one and later in 2006 and um, asked you to, to assist yeah. me. Um, didn't really know what I was doing, but we managed, <laughs> we managed to fool them <laughs> until we figured it out. Um, and I, by I, the way, I, I do remember we ran them from Oh, dark hundred till the end of the day, we ran them. We did. We've we've learned some stuff. We, yeah. we have. But I, I do know almost from the beginning, um, they were filling up. And I think part of the reason was this is before everybody else was doing workshops. I think it'd be a lot harder to get started today than, yeah, than it was back then. So by the time the economy crashed uh, later in, you know, like what, 2008 or so, um, we had a, a really good, solid customer base. And so we were able to ride that through without any real impact and then carry it on. And you and I have both gotten to the point where I would say two thirds to three quarters of our workshops are uh, repeat customers, which mm -hmm. is great. I mean, we've made we've made fantastic friends. It's just been really good. And we've had a lot of a lot of great memories. Um, um, you know, together, you you and me uh, with with our workshop people, and and then on other trips too. I look over my shoulder. I'm looking at that picture, which I'm actually going to present later. But the picture from uh, Grand Canyon, the uh, rainbow with the lightning. You, I know, we were there together with a with a workshop group, and a lot of a lot of other things that we've that we've done together. So. Just real quick, I do I do my own workshops in Death Valley. I'll be going to Death Valley next week, actually. Um, and then I've got Yosemite, winter, spring, and fall. Um, so I'll have a couple in, in February and a couple more in April. Um, and then um, again in October, I do Grand Canyon Monsoon. Uh, I do a Grand Canyon raft trip in, in the spring. Grand Canyon Monsoons in 
usually early August, late July, first couple weeks of August usually. Um, and then Eastern Sierra, Hawaii, um, both of those are Hawaii's mid-September. And then uh, Eastern Sierra at the end or early October, that's, that's a fall color workshop. And then there's the workshops we collaborate on. Um, we'll be going to Iceland here in a couple of weeks, which yeah. is a blast. Um, uh, Iceland in January or February, um, not as cold as a lot of people think, but still pr pretty, pretty cold. Um, and then New Zealand, which yeah, is just, which we you know, both just a highlight. I, I just, I, I just <laughs> can't, can't get enough of New Zealand. If I, if I could move there, I think I would. Yeah. Um, so yeah. those, and those, those are really nice. You know, the regular, the other workshops that I do, of course, are three or, or four or five days long. Um, but our two, our New Zealand and Iceland workshops, those are 10 day workshops. And, you know, it's a little bit, a little bit different where, you know, we've got a driver and, and um, in, in that respect, it's a little easier on us. Um, uh, so anyway, it's not, not a bad way to, to uh, earn a living. No, it's not. Um, and we've, we've, really, we've met some fantastic people. I mean, I just had no idea how much the people part of it would, would mean to me. Um, and, you know, I, I know in Iceland, I, I, the group that we've got coming in Iceland is just a fantastic group. I think um, I know almost everybody and, and you know most of them. So yeah, yeah um, I saw the it's, it's going to be a it's going to be a really fun group. Yeah, and then I come back for a week and turn around and go back over to Norway. Yeah. And yeah. I was looking yeah. at that list this morning. By the way, I'll plug that workshop because we have a few spots left open. Uh, it's all repeat customer, multiple time repeat customer, mm -hmm. not just once or twice. I mean, right. it's going to be like old friends week in, in yeah. Norway when I get and over. It's great getting the new customers. I don't want to make it sound yeah. like you know. I mean, it really is. It really yeah. it really is. But but it's also it's also really nice seeing the people that we know so well, too. So it, it, it's it's really it's really fine either way. There's a you know pluses. A, well, I can't think of many minuses, but there there are real pluses uh, both both ways. Yeah. So. Well, hey, if you're ready, uh, I'm excited to see what you have to show and. Sure. Um, your topic is your camera's vision. And uh, I'm gonna have you go ahead now, Gary, and share your screen. Okay. And uh, this will just take uh, a few seconds, everybody, for us to do the little technical right. thing we have to do here to get Gary's screen up and going. And um, then we'll take a look at all of Gary's fantastic images. So as soon as I see your little icon pop up on my end, there we go. I am going to add you now. And, um, go ahead, Gary, and take it away. Okay, I was gonna. I'm going to come back to that one in just a second. Um, but one of the things that I talk to my workshop students about a lot is is the way the camera sees the world and, and the importance of understanding the way the camera sees the world. Um, because, you know, leading workshops, you get to see a lot of other photographers. And I see one of the things that I, that I see people struggling with is them trying to force the camera to, to, to capture the world the way they see it. Mm -hmm. um, and in the first place, it's, it's impossible. It's literally impossible to photograph the world as the eye sees it, you know, there's so many things that are that are different. There's, you know, dynamic range and focus and and motion and, um, you know, it's the, the camera's world is constrained by a rectangular box, um, you know. So it's there are just a lot of different things that are different, um, and I think rather than trying to force your camera to do something that really isn't capable of doing. Um, it's better to understand the way the camera sees the world and use that difference uh, to creatively uh, share uh, the world, to share aspects of the world that, um, that the human eye doesn't see. Um, and so I, I like to start with this image. This is a, uh, this demonstrates, you know, um, dynamic range. So one of the things 
that um, we hear a lot as photographers is 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 that the way it really looked? Um, and you know, and, and I think there's a little bit of skepticism when people ask us that question, like we somehow faked it. No, we're not faking it. And but this is not the way this scene looked to my eye. But this is the way it looked to my camera because I understood my camera's limited dynamic range and leveraged that to basically I underexposed it. Um, so this is this is um, half dome here. I El Capitan here, half dome here. Um, and Don, you were here with me for this. You yeah, know, I you remember know, we this. Had very similar images from this morning. And, but you know how hard I worked to plot this. This wasn't an accident. I, um, you know, figured out where the moon was going to rise and when we should be there. We actually had a workshop group there. I scheduled a workshop mm -hmm. around this. And, but still, this is the first time I tried this shot from this location. So, I, I, I have to interject, Gary, because yeah. I do remember this vividly, and I gotta I gotta tell the people out there that uh, sometimes they just don't know how hard the, or how much the photographer yeah. is stressing that it's all going to work out. Yeah. And I can remember this being a very cold morning, and we showed up in the dark. And yeah, this was, this was May. You, you were sweating bullets, not yeah. literally, but yeah. inside. I knew you were. Yeah. I, were stressing. I, I, I had been building it up yeah. and I knew how special it could be if it happened. But boy, I'll tell you, when I saw that little sliver, just the first little tip of the moon <laughs> start to slide out here. Oh, it was awesome. It was, it was just ecstasy. But the, the, the point I, I, I like to make with this image is that to my eye, to our eye, everybody there, we could see detail in El Capitan and we could see, you know, not a lot. I mean, it was dark. Yeah. It was definitely dark. But, you know, when, you, when you're out there in a, uh, uh, you know, just in the, in the pre-dawn twilight, you can, you can make out, you know, shape and a little bit of detail. So we could see, you know, some, some trees down here and, you know, we, you know, some, you know, some texture in, in the granite. But really what I wanted to do was to use my camera's limited dynamic range to create silhouettes uh, because El Capitan and Half Dome are so distinctive. Um, they, they stand out just as silhouettes. So I got their shape um, and then by underexposing it to, to, to turn these black and, and just get the shape against the sky, I also saved the color in the sky, which was starting to brighten up. So. But, but rather than letting the sky wash out by capturing detail down here, I underexposed it, um, held some color in the sky and got the shape of, uh, of El Capitan and Half Dome, which is, this is a, a uniquely Yosemite image because, I mean, everybody, I don't say everybody, but, but most people recognize these outlines. They're so, they're so distinctive. Yeah. So again, to, to, to my eye, to, to everybody's eye, there was a lot more information in the scene. I wanted to simplify it to just color and shape. And then, of course, having the crescent moon here was, you know, was the, the perfect uh, kicker to the whole thing. Um, so, but, you know, another, the, the image, image I had up here just a second ago, this image, this is the same thing in the other direction. This is a high key shot. Again, everything I saw everything you see here that's white in, in here, this was blue sky. But I knew if my camera was not going to be able to bring out the detail on the, on the underside of this poppy, the color on the other side of this poppy and capture the blue sky. Um, so I just turned that sky into a white background. That, if, if, if you have your blinking highlights set, you can just imagine when I looked at this picture, this it all this was completely uh just blinking like crazy <laughs> this um it was it was all completely blown out um i have one more picture too where i did a similar thing uh let's see where are the dogwood there we go same kind of thing that's blue sky just got underneath the dogwood i and and um, a dogwood have, have a beautiful translucence. So if you can get sunlit dogwood and get on the backside, uh, underneath side, they, they, they tend to glow. Um, and then I turn the blue sky 
uh, into into just a white background for for the dog bread. As as I think you you may have mentioned, and, and I'll elaborate. Um, I don't do any kind of blending or everything. I got I do I do with one click. Um, so and then I don't do you know like I don't do background replacement. I don't I don't do any of that that stuff in in Photoshop. I, I like I like my creativity to be in the camera, not in the computer. So, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, processing is an important part of what I do, but the processing is to get the most out of what I got in the camera and not to, um, you know, change the picture and, and add things to the picture that, that weren't there. Um, so that's a dynamic range, one, one difference um, between the human vision and the camera's vision. Um, another one is range of focus. Um, so let's see. Um, we've got, you know, to to the, you know, to the the camera or to the human eye, you know, you can see, you know, near, you can see far. The camera handles focus a little bit differently. Um, and I like to use that difference to emphasize aspects of my scene. I wrote an article for Outdoor Photographer. I think we forgot to mention in my um, and the, when, during the intro, I, I, I'm a writer as well, so I've got a, I've got a weekly blog that I, that I do. Uh, but I, I wrote an article um, not long ago for out, outdoor photographer. You know, may it rest in peace. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, that where I talked about creative selective focus, where I use focus techniques um, to soften my background and and, and focus the eye where I want it to go. Um, so what you see here, um, these poppies, this is, you know, getting down on the ground, macro lens with extension tubes so I could get really close. Everything that you see back here is, a, is that's out of focus is a field of poppies. We had a whole hillside. And if you know California, not every year, but many years, we get these poppy blooms that are just absolutely mm -hmm. breathtaking. And um, you know, entire hillsides are, are, are gold. This was one of those times. And um, so I got up really close. I was probably, I was just, just a few inches from these poppies, wide open, probably F2.8 with my macro lens. Um, and I just focused, the only thing that's sharp here is really this edge right here. I think this edge might be sharp too, but just right in here. And the rest of it is some, some degree of soft. There was another poppy here that's you know, obviously you can, it's, it's not so soft that you can't figure out what it is, but then the rest of the poppies were a little farther back and they just softened to, to color. Um, that's not what my eye saw. That's what my camera saw. And it's, it's a matter of understanding, you know, the settings um, and, and the focus techniques to make this happen. This is not something that I, I did in Photoshop. This is something I did in the field. Um, so when, when my eyes were there, th this is not what my eyes saw. As soon as I looked through my viewfinder, it's, it's what I saw because um, I, I had my, um, my, my, my focus set up to, uh, you know, I was wide open as, as the, the lens would be, um, you know, when, when you look through the viewfinder. Um, but it's just, it's, it's, I, this is one of my oldest pictures and I've uh, it's still, it's still one of my, one of my very favorites. Yeah. I can see why. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Um, another thing that, that a lot of people fail to appreciate. Um, I think they know it on a certain level, but is, you know, if photography is an attempt to render a, a three dimensional world in a two dimensional medium and it, it you can't do it, you know, we, we lose the, the dimension that we're missing is depth. So we can't actually cr capture depth with, with, a, with a conventional image, but we can create the illusion of depth by, by things that we, by, by the way we compose and focus. Um, so let's see here. Here's, here's an example. This is a, a scene um, I was giving, actually giving a, a private tour to, to a customer um, quite a few years ago. Um, I'd always visualized this picture, um, never gotten a situation to, to capture it until this day. Um, 
these are little pools. Um, it, there had just been, there had been a thunderstorm that afternoon. We got up there right after the storm, so the pools were full. Um, and I, I got down um, on the ground. I actually set this shop, shot up at probably a half hour before sunset because I could see all the ingredients were in place for a real nice sunset. We had the sun's behind me. We had a hole on the horizon, so I knew the clouds were going to get light. Uh, the air was perfectly clean. Um, a lot of people don't understand that that you need clear air. The cleaner the air, the better um, the color will be. Um, and so we had, you know, the, the rain that had been, or the, the air, air had been, atmosphere had been scoured by the rain. Um, and we did, we got some spectacular color. Um, and so, but the idea of when, when you're doing a, 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 a scene like this, you know, always have to be thinking about that missing dimension and how to introduce elements to create the illusion of depth. So I'm always looking for something for my foreground um, if if my primary subject's in the background, I don't just settle for that subject. I look for a, a, a subject to put with it or vice versa. If my primary subject's in the foreground, then I'm always looking to make sure I've got the best background for it. So here, yeah, Half Dome's kind of the star of the show at, at Sentinel Dome. Um, yeah, there's actually a lot of stars there. There's a, a, you go, you take the hike, it's about a mile hike up to the top of Sentinel Dome and it's 360 degree view. But Half Dome's right there. It's not that, it's not too far away. Um, so I just got down really low because I wanted to get some of this color reflected in the water. And the only way to do that was to get down as low as possible. So I got down low. I put these, these, little uh, little pools in, in my foreground. And then I just waited for the, the sky to light up. I, I probably focused in here. Um, you have to you know understand a little bit about focus. If you're, if you're trying to focus, a lot of people make the mistake um, of, you know, you, you know they, they, they do it right when they, when they put something in their foreground uh, to go with the background. But then they, they make the mistake of focusing on the closest thing in the picture, mm -hmm. which is a mistake. The reason it's a mistake is you get focus in front of your, your focus point. So if you focus on the closest thing in your frame, then you're going to get focus in front of it that you don't really need. So that's just where it's important to understand hyperfocal technique. Um, and you always want to focus a little bit behind the closest thing. So when I get a scene like this, I identify the closest thing that needs to be sharp. And then I focus a little bit behind it. And the, the real art to that is knowing how much a little bit is because it varies with a lot of things. And that's a whole different topic we won't get into. Yeah. Um, I do have some blog articles about stuff like that too. So if you want to go poking around my blog, um, it's www.garyhartblog.com. Um, I, you can you can find it um, that way, or you can come to a workshop. Um, so anyway, this this idea of creating the illusion of, of depth um, by finding you know having subjects near and far. Um, and another thing that's really important is is to avoid merging subjects. Um, sometimes you you can't avoid that, but. Uh, to the you know extent that we can, we at least see things. You've got something at different distances. The less you can have them merged, because they're gonna, it's gonna flatten out. Uh, the less you can have them merged, the greater the illusion of depth you can create. Let's see. Do I have any others? Oh yeah, I have one other one that just demonstrates the same thing. Uh, let's see. That's not it. And this would be one of these situations, Gary, where while you're looking for this next picture, you and I have both seen over the many years we've taught workshops where it'd be so easy for a student to get seduced by just just uh, half dome and the and the beautiful clouds and forget mm -hmm. about looking for a foreground. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That's such a great point. There's a real tendency. Oh my gosh, look at that great sunset. Oh, and you know, people, they, they, they forget to, to create an image and they'll just, they'll shoot the beauty, but you really do have to take the time to, to create the image that, that, that 
does the beauty justice. Yeah. So um, I'm not sure what's going to happen here. I'm going to, the picture that I'm looking for is actually not, I don't know. Just give me a second. I'm going to. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's okay. We're, we'll just go on. Th th this illustrates the point. This illustrates the point well enough. Um, okay, so missing dimension. Um, another thing that, that we as photographers have to deal with that's different than the human experience is this idea. Um, you know, when you're standing out in nature, you've got basically a 360 degree view. You've got, you know, you, you, can, you, can, you can see all of the world just, you know, pivoting around. It's a, it's a totally different experience. Whereas the camera, when we're creating an image, is constrained by a rectangular box. It's up to us to determine where that box goes. Mm -hmm. So um, I've got a couple of, you know, you know here's, here's one. Um, obviously, this, when, when, when you're there, this is, um, this is El Capitan in Yosemite. It's from a, uh, 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 it, a location, Valley View, which anybody who's been to Yosemite knows about it, or Gates of the Valley is. Um, as it has been called as well. Um, but I wanted I, I, I wanted to focus this image on the reflection. And so it's power that we as photographers have deciding what our viewers' eyes are going to do in the frame and how much of the scene we, we want to show them. Um, and in this particular case, this, the reflection, this is just about as good a reflection as you can get. A lot of people think this is, oh, is that Mirror Lake? No, no Mirror Lake is, <laughs> is, is Half Dome. It's on the other side of the valley. This is actually the Merced River. But um, in, in some autumns before the first snow has happened, um, the river can be really low. It doesn't dry. Uh, it's actually been low enough that I walked across it uh, at this location. But, you know, went up maybe to my knees. Um, but when it gets this low, um, you can get some just absolutely spectacular reflections here. Um, the, the recipe for a good reflection, for the, for the best reflection, is wa still water like this, a sunlit subject, and a shaded water surface. And that doesn't mean you can't get reflections, uh, you know, if the subject isn't uh, lit or... or um, the subject does have sunlight on it, but the best reflections you've got your 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 reflective subject lit and the reflective surface in shade. Um, but I used my camera's limited um, range, the, the rectangular box, to emphasize just the reflection. Um, and um, you know, I, again, this is again, this is a fairly old image that has been one of my most popular. I used to do this. I used to have this one in bins at my art show when I when I did art shows, um, and invariably I'd go through. People would have picked have picked the picture up and turned it around upside down, um, so they 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 put El Capitan upright. Um, and then I'd go back in and I put it down uh, <laughs> the way the way I captured it and the way I wanted it, the way I wanted it to be. Um, another another one that I think illustrates the same the same thing is this picture here. Um, this has actually been on um, a couple magazine covers, um, and it's just a simple little picture. Um, but this this really illustrates the power we have as photographers, um, where when I'm there at this scene, there's just there's a bunch of leaves. There's this is this is Bridalville Creek beneath Bridalville Fall, so there's leaves everywhere, um, rocks, cascades. There's a lot going on. It's a busy, busy scene. Trees up above. You can kind of see the fall through the trees, um, and by taking the the borders of my cam of, of of my view uh, through my viewfinder, um, I was able to completely eliminate all that busyness and focus just on this one leaf on a rock. Um, now, I know people are asking, did you put that leaf there? No, <laughs> and I, I, I don't do that. I think I think the natural world is beautiful enough. I, it doesn't need my help. Um, but I look for things like this. I can isolate. Oh, by, and by the way, I have no idea 
Um, this leaf could have been put there by a photographer who was there a half hour from, for me. I have no idea, but this is the way I found it. Um, and, and I, you know, I photographed down here enough to know I've seen leaves, you know, they fall from the trees, they, they land on these wet rocks and they do kind of stick. Um, but I, I always look for something I can isolate in my frame to make it, you know, what, I, I want my picture to be about something. So this picture was about this leaf. Um, and I, I just positioned myself and then framed it, um, to, to, you know, so it, it completely isolated this leaf and this cascade from all of the other um, stuff that was going on around it. Okay. Um, another thing that, and this is something that the camera really does better. We're always complaining about the cameras, um, you know, oh, I wish we had more dynamic range and blah, blah, you know, and, you know, focus and so people are doing focus stacking and and hdr and all those things i don't i don't do and i'm not saying there's anything wrong with that stuff it's just not the way i photograph um but one thing that the camera does beat the human eye in is this ability to accumulate light so to be able to pull light out of uh, uh by keeping the shutter open and accumulating it on in the sensor now, uh, the, the way we're currently shooting. Um, and so, you know, it allows us to do things, you know, like, you know, here's a Milky Way shot. This is this is the Puna Coast um, in um, the, on the big island of Hawaii. Um, this is, the, I don't do any kind of, I hear a lot of blue hour blends and other things. This is one click. Um, I was actually with a workshop group here. It was not the smartest thing I've done. This was this was not the safest location to take a group of people out to in the middle of the night. Um, it, it, uh, because right beneath me is about a 15 foot drop onto rocks like this. Um, and it was quite dark. Um, and since then I've found a better place to do this shot. That's a little bit, a little bit safer and we get us, we can get a similar result if we're fortunate enough, um, which, in, on the big island um, it often doesn't happen with there are no clouds. Um, but anyway, this is not what my eye saw. My, it was a lot darker to my eye, um, but the, because I could keep my shutter open and I went with high ISO, um, I was able to capture the, the Milky Way brighter than what my eye saw. I mean, it's beautiful on a dark sky like this, but it, it you can't see it that well. Um, and also the this rugged lava um, rock, and the, you know this rock here um, is probably no more than I, I, I'm not sure. I'd have to look at it, um, but um, probably a few hundred years old or or less. Most of the stuff down on the on the coast, um, the Puna coast, uh, is relatively new rock. Um, in fact, there's some of the areas we go in my Hawaii workshop. Um, where the the I've been doing the workshops there longer than than the coastline has been there. Um, there have been some lava flows in the, just in the last few years or so that are brand new that that's added coastline. So uh, I, I have a couple. Actually, I have a couple more pictures I like to share. Um, I think I've got one. Let's see. Oh, here, this, I, I had to get a New Zealand picture in here. Yeah. Um, this is one of our favorite spots. And mm -hmm. the, one of the reasons I, I really like this, this is similar, you know, it's dark, we're out there. Um, this is not nearly as treacherous. We parked the car, we walked maybe 30 feet out to the side of Lake Wakatipu. And um, it's just this nice, peaceful coastline. Uh, we get to watch the Milky Way come up. You, you'll notice we're in the Southern Hemisphere. The Milky Way is actually reversed from what, what we see in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, if you go back, you, if you look at, at the, the the bright part here and go back and look at um, the picture I just showed you. I don't see it now. There it is. The bright part is actually up here, and you can also see um, how high the Milky Way is in the sky um, down there too. Um, but anyway, 
Uh, and this is this is um, the large Magellanic uh, cloud. Um, I think it says in my label it says small. I'll have to double check. I um, I'm not as familiar with the southern hemisphere sky, um, but we have two satellite galaxies of the of the uh, our, around our Milky Way, so they're gravitationally connected to the Milky Way, our Milky Way, our home galaxy um, that you can't see in the northern hemisphere. And they're called the Magellanic Clouds. Um, there's a large one and a small one, and you can see them with the naked eye on a dark sky. You can, we could see them from this location, but nowhere near like that. They're just little tiny fuzzy smudges to the eye and the camera, because of its ability to accumulate light, can uh, can really uh, bring them out nicely. Um, and then do I have one other one? Because this is a little bit different. Let's see. Yeah, I don't. Let's see. I'm going to go away here for a second. There we go. And can you see that? Yes. Okay. So this is. I, I'm going to bring something up from the Iceland trip because it's a, it's a question that comes up a lot, um, and it, this is another thing that really illustrates what the camera can do. Um, that the eye can't do. People say, well, do you see the color when you see the Northern Lights? Um, you can, um, although it takes a, an especially brilliant Northern Lights display to see the color, but the camera can always see the color better than the eye can see. Yeah, for sure. I got to tell you though, um, even though you don't see as much color with the eye as the camera reveals, so you, we see all these spectacular Northern Lights pictures um, there's nothing subtle about the Northern Lights display, uh, a, a nice Northern Lights display like this is. And there's, I don't care how beautiful a picture you get, there's nothing like seeing it in person. Yeah. And I know you'd agree, Don. Oh, definitely. It, it is, even if you don't see the color as vividly as you see this, um, to, to have the entire sky, there, it, was, it was doing stuff behind us too. Yeah, uh, this was just last um, last January um, on on our trip, um, but um, anyway, it is really cool um, that the way the camera can pull the color out. Um, we saw a little bit of green with the eye. We couldn't really see the the red with the eye, but it's but it's there. So, okay. Um, oh. One of the another cool thing that the camera can do, and it, it, this has to do with um, with motion, um, and way I, I I call it expand time. Um, you remember this, Don? I do. Yeah, yeah. we were sitting on. The, and this was a long time ago. This was yeah, it really was <laughs> ten years ago, something like that. Right at the beginning, just sitting out on the rim at at um, uh, Desert. Desert View, the Grand yeah. Canyon, which is one of my favorite views. Yeah, there, um, and it's it's what's really cool is from there the the North Star is almost is just pretty much straight due north, um, and just doing like a I don't know this is probably a twenty minute exposure. Yeah, I but think that's this, about what we did. Yeah, yeah, and the, again, this is is this the way it looked to us? Obviously not. It didn't look anything like this to us, but the camera has this ability to you keep the shutter open. I call it expand time. Um, and so it can reveal aspects of the world that we can't see. Um, and, and, and so this reveals the Earth's rotation on its axis. Um, the axis happens to be just coincidentally, it just points right at the North Star. That's just a, just a, it is really a coincidence. Um, there's a thing called precession of the equinoxes. It just happens to be right now. Uh, so we, we're basically the, the axis, you know, does, does a circle. Um, I think it's, what is it, 26,000 years, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. But right now we happen to be pointing, it. our axis happens to be pointing right at uh, Polaris, the, the North Star. Um, so anyway, but even if, if the star wasn't there, we'd still see these concentric circles. Um, if we just wouldn't have a dot a dot in the center. Um, but it's, it's just a cool thing. I, I love the way we can can share aspects of the world um, that 
with a camera that that, that the human experience uh, uh, it can't it can't see. Yeah, uh, I agree. And and another, uh, you know, a little bit more terrestrial. Um, let's see if I can find it. Let's see, is it not here? Okay, hold on. Let me go. So I'll go grab it because I like I like this. Um, there. Um, again, this is doing the same thing, um, and uh, just long exposure. Um, it was actually quite dark, not not completely dark, but this is a twilight picture. I didn't need an, an ND filter because it was dark enough. I could do it's probably a thirty second exposure. Um, but to to us standing there. You know, we could see leaves, you know, leaves in the water and they're kind of floating around. But it, by by opening up the shutter for 30 seconds, um, we were able to show that there's there really is a pattern to the to the way the water is moving. So you can see, you know, here the water is just moving straight downstream, but it gets over in here and it's just these little eddies and it swirls around. And of course, when it, we've got nice fall color some of those swirls are are yellow the white you see is just foam that's in the water but again nothing like what our eye saw um but it's you know it 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 is it is it's real it's it's what the camera saw yeah. um and understanding that i think is just is is the power that we have as photographers um and I've got one more example. Again, this just has to do with motion um, because it, it, again, we, our world is is moving. Okay, we see we see more of a video version. It's one of the things I like about still photography is that it it allows us to we we we're freezing the world. Um, whereas when you're when you're well, when you're looking at a video, for example, the, the the world is moving along at its pace. And if you really want to look at something, what do you do? You freeze it. Um, I, Don, uh, you know how you know we we both love photographing lightning. I mean, yeah. it's it's oh. just it's it's just <laughs> one of my favorite things in the world. And um, let's see. So a couple of things. I know you were here for this one. Oh yeah. <laughs> and. But when, when you photograph light, and I know you have your version, your own version of this one too, which is which is pretty cool too. Um, but when when you're photographing lightning, it comes and goes so quickly that that it's over before you. It's really more of a memory. By by the time your brain processes it, it's a memory. It's it's gone before your brain can can process it. Whereas a camera, if you ca if you capture it at the right time, you see how much intricate detail is is in there. Yeah. Um, this is something that the camera can do that that I think is better than the human experience. We caught this ball. This <laughs> we went inside. <laughs> this this. We were watching this storm and it was moving closer and and we actually happened to know that we were in a pretty safe place we were on the on the deck of the grand canyon lodge on the north rim and um there there are lightning rods there we had an electrical engineer in one of our workshops tell us that oh yeah no you're you're pretty safe here um i felt better about that it still uh, still but, makes you jump when it happens well so. yeah and and even still <laughs> Yeah. As soon as this one hit, this was um, this was a mile away. This this was just I I, I did a, a, a quick calculation with a topo app that I've got and determined that 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 this is called Oza Butte, and it, it is just about a mile away. Mm -hmm. uh, so so we went inside and we couldn't really photograph. There were a whole bunch of other people out there too, but we could still watch the show from the, from from the inside, which was which was pretty neat. But anyway, this ability, you know, so here, in the last picture I showed you, we we stretch time by keeping the shutter open a long time. We can freeze it too. Um, people, a lot of people ask, you know, well, how, how did you shoot that? Um, you know, did you just click when you saw the lightning? No, that doesn't work. It's too fast. We have uh, lightning triggers. Um, and 
Um, it, I mean, it is the actual lightning trigger. Right? People are using that name as a generic. Uh, there's only one device that that can legally be called the lightning trigger. And that's what we use because they work better than anything else we've tried. Um, they're not fancy um, by any means, um, but they get stuff that we've had people with other lightning sensors uh, in our workshops. Um, and we've, we haven't found one, anything that comes close to capturing the stuff we can capture um, with our lightning triggers. So what we do is we get our exposure set up, we get our focus, uh, we we have certain shutter speeds that we like to get to maximize, you know, to, to get the right effect. You can't be too fast, but you can't be too slow. Um, and so we help our, our workshop students do that. Um, but we, we set it up, um, focus, exposure, um, and then, and, and composition kind of anticipate where the lightning is going to be. And then we... Um, it's just stand back and watch. And it's like fishing. It's like waiting for the fish to strike. You know, it's fun. It's a lot yeah. Oh, it's, it's great. And the last picture I've got, uh, and I know you, you remember this one too, Don. Um, let's see. Again, this is the same, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what a morning. One of our most memorable mornings uh, as workshop leaders, where it was the last morning of I think it was our first Grand Canyon monsoon workshop. Yeah. We used to do these workshops together. Um, and we the forecast was for nothing. Nothing clear uh, skies. <laughs> and 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 sunrise is early. And we we had a couple people that just decided to sleep in. It's the last morning. There's clear skies forecast. Um, but this is why you just get up and do it anyway, because we walked out and it was by when we walked out there this morning, this is, we can walk out here from, from the lodge where we stay. Um, when, when we walked out that morning, it was dark and you could see the flashes on the horizon. It's like, yeah. Oh my gosh, there's something yeah. going on. And so we, we walked all the way out to the point and we just had the most incredible display. It lasted a couple hours. Oh. Uh, and, and it moved across from left to right. So that was from east to west. Um, it just moved right across the rim. And at some point I'm looking and I'm going, I, I say to Don, you know what? We might get a rainbow because I could see there was a there was a hole on the horizon. And sure enough, just a few minutes later, um, there was, a, oh, you know what? I, I don't think I said that to you because you, you had stopped down the trail a little bit. Far. I must've said it to somebody else. You had stopped down the trail a little bit farther because you had just had your knee replaced. You did. Right. That's right. You, were, you, you <laughs> deserved a medal for that trip. You were three weeks out from a knee replacement and you came to right. the workshop. <laughs> um, I forgot about that. Yeah. That's right. So you were just and down the you were praying the lightning over. would get nowhere near me because you guys could run and I could barely yeah. walk. But you still, I know you got a shot. You got a nice shot too. Yeah. Uh, maybe of this, of this same thing. But anyway, um, and sure enough, here came this rainbow. And so people say, well, that's fake. You know, I, it, it really isn't. This was a one third wow. second exposure. I mean, I was just pointed in that direction with all my exposure settings set up and just letting my triggers trigger my camera. Yeah. And it, it just, it, it, those three things happen, strikes happened in, in that one third second. Um, you know, it's just one of the most exciting moments of my life. That whole that whole show was pretty spectacular. Yeah, yeah. And this was the, you know, this was the, you know, the the grand finale, <laughs> I guess. Um, but anyway, the, the whole point with this is um, I don't even think I saw these three bolts hit. I mean, these th things were going on and I'm working with workshop students and things like that. Um, but but they, they come and go so quickly. You know, we'll be out there with our trigger set. And if somebody goes, oh, my gosh. You know, if, if you're not looking when by the when, by the time somebody reacts to a lightning strike and you it's look gone. up, it's gone. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the camera can capture that and and it's forever now. Yeah. So. And you still do that workshop, Gary. I, this I was one you and I started doing together. And yeah. when I started cutting my schedule back, this was one I uh, kind of reluctantly let go. <laughs> uh, and I and I miss it because uh, I just. I can remember that, you, like you said, when you go out to do this, you're not really sure what you're getting. 
you may see something and you're going, oh my gosh, I hope my camera, the trigger got that. Mm -hmm. And then when it's all over, we go running back into our rooms yeah. and we're just chimping like crazy to see if we, we got these frames. And yep. I actually saw a picture very similar to this. I was going through a folder this morning of some of my favorite images looking for something for a project I'm working on. And I came across this image this morning, and I, I know I have one. It's very similar to this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so anyway, it's. But you know, again, I hope you know by sharing all these images, I've I've con conveyed um, the importance of understanding the the way the, uh, of understanding the way your camera sees the world and how it differs from the from the way you see it. And there's there's no obligation to reproduce the world. We're not we're not trying to do journalistic photography. Right. Okay. We're trying to do artistic photography. And for me, artistic photography isn't creating things that aren't there, but it, it is trying to to convey the world in ways that the human experience um, can't do. Yeah. So um, and. You know, it's it really is. It, it's not it's not simply composition. And again, this could also be another talk in and of itself. But it, it's it's re it really is important to be able to manage your exposure variables. I call it the the tree the creative triad: motion, light, and depth. So you have to be able to to do things with motion. You have to uh, do things with light and do things with depth of field. And all of those things require the ability to, to manage your exposure variables, to control the depth of field, to control the, the, the motion or to control the light. You can't just go and, you know, let your camera decide, well, you know, you're going to get a good exposure, but are you, is that exposure going to, going to blur some motion you want frozen or is it going to freeze some motion you want blurred? Is it going to, uh, make something sharp that should be soft or make something sh soft that should be sharp. You really need to control all those things yourself. Fortunately, that that kind of control is is easy. People get really intimidated by, you know, camera settings. And, and it's, it's, it is really quite simple. Um, and once once you you learn it, and it really does just take a few minutes, uh, it takes a few minutes to learn it. It takes a lot longer to master it. But once you once you've learned it, you say, "Yeah, that really is pretty simple." And then you just have to keep working on it until you've got it mastered. I agree. Well, hey, I uh, I, I guess we're going to wrap this up here. Um, we did a good job at keeping it right to about the time about we uh, planned. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank you, Gary, for taking the time to come on. I know you're about ready to go out to Death Valley, and then yeah. I'm going to be seeing you um, over in Iceland. And yeah. I just uh, was texting back and forth with our guide and good friend, uh, Albert Dross, this morning. Yeah, I'm yeah. looking forward to seeing him again. It'll be fun to see him. Um, so uh, I want to thank all of you if you've hung in here with us. Uh, you guys have seen some amazing photography. Check out Gary's workshops. Uh, we, you know, www.garyhartphotography.com. Or you, uh, he's or you doing can... way more than I am at this point, but I'm still teaching, and I plan to still teach. I'm just down to about eight workshops a year now. And I, how about how many do you have to, now, Gary? Oh gosh, a dozen, twelve to. 15, depending on, you know, a few variables, yeah, something like that. So Gary, if you just go to GaryHartWorkshops.com, it'll take you right to my schedule, which right. you can also get to by going to my website. Um, right. Yeah. So. And check out, I know for this year, we're sold out for Iceland. Um, we we had a couple spots a space or two in, in New Zealand. In New Zealand. Yeah. I know there's two people very interested in taking those last two spots. So. Um, but send Gary an email or you can send me and I'll, I'll forward it to Gary and uh, we'd love to see you guys. And we're going to definitely have both those workshops again next year. So um, we hope to see you uh, down the line in one of our workshops. And uh, yeah. so Gary, we'll wrap this up. I'll let you uh, have your evening off here. All right. <laughs> have a great <laughs> workshop out in um Death Valley, and I will see you, I guess, in Seattle in about a couple of weeks. And we'll yeah, fly over right. to Reykjavik. Two weeks from today, we, we, um, we leave. We, 
that's true. Yeah, yeah, and off to Reykjavik, and yeah, and the two the two airlines we use both fly um, the Boeing seven thirty seven Max jet. So oh, we'll, comforting. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Hopefully, maybe they'll stay grounded for. <laughs> For just a couple, a couple of weeks. If the window blows out, I certainly hope it's on the Seattle side and not on the Iceland I'm side. I'm keeping my seatbelt fastened. <laughs> fast I'm not taking any chances. <laughs> okay. Well, once again, I appreciate it. And I sure. thank all of you for spending the time with us. And I hope you found this uh, enjoyable and educational. And I know I did. I, I always love looking at Gary's images. So um, check them out online. And uh, we will see you guys down the line. Thanks, Don. This has been great. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.